Yay, I am here with Haisu Park, who is professor at Bellevue College, was a visiting professor at Flame University in, from India, in India, and uh, my goodness, it's been, what, six years now since you got your PhD here at OSU? Yeah, six years, yeah, time flies, yeah. Um, anyway, I am so excited to have you here, Haisu, to talk about comics and media and um, the work that you've been doing. Welcome. Thank you for inviting so let's start at the kind of the origin story stuff um how you got into this stuff how did you get into studying media and comics culture etc i um no i grew up and studied in uh, south korea and uh, until i came to the u.s for uh, graduate schools and manhwa which is um korean comics was pretty much part of um growing up so i used to read it a lot but manhwa was also televised on TV, so I was uh, watching a lot of manhwa on TV when I was little. But then I really never thought about, you know, studying comics or manhwa because in Korea, when I was there, um, comics were kind of considered to be uh, something to avoid, uh, negative. And I think that's still largely the case uh, in Korea even today. Uh, we don't teach comics that much at universities. So I remember you know, reading comics with my friends in middle school and high school during breaks, but we were doing that like secretly because uh, if our teachers found out about it, they would take our books away. But then of course that uh, changed when I came to the US and joined the uh, Ohio State for my PhD. And, and also, you know, frankly, uh, your work influenced me to kind of get into uh, comics. And you know, I remember I have uh, the copy your brain on Latino comics, and you published it almost the same year I started the PhD program. And I wanted to do something similar with um, you know, Asian comics and Asian mm -hmm. American comics. And also I was very you know, interested in readerly cognition and emotion and how you know, the ways in which fiction is uh, constructed influence the ways in which uh, readers think and feel. And talking about those things with um, you know, novels and short story was a little bit difficult. I felt as I was kind of stretching myself to argue about reader's cognition and emotion. But with the comics, it was easier because I can really focus on certain visual choices and formal choices and relate that to reader's cognition and emotion just a lot better. So, so that's kind of how I got interested. And then from there, of course, uh, media studies was, I think it's just a natural transition. Um, you know, I was thinking about um, print comics initially, but then I started studying digital comics. And with that, I got into transmedia storytelling and media convergence, right? And with that, it's just media studies generally. So that's how I got started. Hi, so let me ask you a question. Um, two questions, I guess. Um, you mentioned that in South Korea, comics are, they're still kind of a stigma attached to them yeah. what kind of you know what what do what it like what do adults like see why are why are there why is there still a, a stigma and what kind of stigma and the second question is uh, well yeah let's start with that one yeah you know i guess it's because it's more visual than verbal right so we are still having this idea that book reading should be about reading the text, right? So if there's more visual, it's an easy book and it's a uh, comics are still considered to be like children's book. So we as adults, especially someone who is academically serious, you are not really supposed to read the comics. And, and also I think our academic environment is a, a little bit outdated to be honest. Um, so a lot of professors who are teaching at our uh, university, they are not kind of exposed to, they were not exposed to comics when they were studying in the US or Europe. So they can't really bring that uh, back to Korea either. So I think that's kind of a large problem there. But it is changing, so I can see that, but um, not as much as here. Um, hey, Sue, and we might get to this a little bit later in our conversation, but for our audience, what is what would you think is the kind of fundamental difference or kind of characteristic of manhwa as opposed to manga, for instance? You know, it's um it's a very similar to be honest. Um, you know, um, it, the drawing styles can be similar. Um, um, uh, subject matter can be really similar as well. But um, uh, the difference will be a, a manhwa, when we talk about manhwa in Korea, it's mostly those that are televised on TV. So it's kind of TV comics. 
So we have like manga style comic books, but we have this manhwa style television show that we watch on TV. But when you look at just the visual style, it's very similar. Mm, very interesting. Um, you've just published Media Culture in Transnational Asia. So exciting. Um, why, why commit your time to research and write on media culture in Asia? Um, you know, I, I think that's a really uh, good question. Um, you know, there are a few reasons, but I think largely because um, uh, a lot of te technological and media innovations are coming out of Asia right now. Um, you know, as you know, um, Asia has a lot of younger population, younger educated population. They are very tech savvy. Uh, Korea, for example, we have almost 100% uh, smartphone ownership rate. And fastest internet in the world and, and almost 88 cities out of 100 uh, major cities are 5G wired already. And, you know, India, the, the world's largest exporter of IT technology and, you know, Chinese, um, you know, speaker alone form almost a quarter of the uh, world's population. So we are contributing a lot to the development of the uh, um, digital technology and, and media industry. But, but I think media studies generally is still a very wide um, academic field. Um, you know, we, when we talk about or write about uh, media studies, we still refer to mostly, um, you know, scholars from the U.S. and Europe, and they themselves talk a lot about media products coming out of um, uh, Europe and the U.S., all right? So, so I think it's just important to uh, kind of use Asia as a method uh, to uh, think about what's happening in Asia. And, and, and also to think about what's happening in the West as well. So uh, when you are using Asia as the anchoring point, what new perspectives uh, can we gain, right? So, so that is a kind of um, um, you know, question that I started with uh, when I was working on this book. So, and, and another thing that I was really trying hard in this book was to invite uh, scholars who are actually teaching and researching in Asia because we do have scholars who talk about Asian media, but again, I think most of the scholars are based in Europe or US. But what about scholars who are actually in Asia? Because I feel as the, uh, their life experience from the region can really enrich our understanding of what's happening there on a uh, daily basis. And you know, if I, I can talk about a few, few examples for, you know, uh, one of our contributors, she talked about how Chinese fans uh, responded to the 2016 uh, Star Wars film. And they responded to that film so through the uh, pro amateur uh, video production. So they create those videos and post those videos on YouTube to talk about their opinions on the film's um, you know, representation of Chinese character and how that kind of video production add extra layers of narrative and meaning to the professional uh, med, uh, you know, media production and, and you know, ultimately kind of change the landscape of the um, media production in general. Yeah, and, really significant and so important. Um, yeah, please, Heisu. Yeah, and, and, and for example, also, you know, the use of uh, social media such as Facebook and Instagram in Afghanistan and Iran. Um, those are really interesting as well. You know, there are what's really interesting is that we see kind of um, intersection between the universality and specificities in terms of Afghans and Iranian use of social media. And I think that intersection is the place that we have to dwell on to really better understand what social media really mean to us. Mm. Amazing. And uh, it's really a remarkable, groundbreaking book that you've uh, put together with all this incredible scholarship. Let me ask you, um, the convergence, of course, is very central and important, um, along with, you know, scholarship that's very regionally situated. But why transmedia in Asia in particular? Um, yeah, why? Yeah, you know, the, the, I think transmedia and media convergence, right? I think in Asia, but also worldwide, I think it's a very unavoidable trend right now. Um, you know, in Korea alone, we have uh, made a shift from print comics to uh, digital comics a long time ago, right? 
and, and a lot of those uh, web, uh, digital comics are turned into films successfully. So we see this transmedia storytelling and, and media convergence on a daily basis, right? So that's the trend that we have to, of course, study and embrace. But just, uh, I think personally, I'm interested in transmedia storytelling and media convergence because um, they, they clearly depart from the uh, digital revolution model uh, where the people assume that new media will replace the old media, right? Instead, in transmedia storytelling and media convergence, we are really forced to uh, look into those multiple delivery channels and the ways in which different mediums work with their own respective affordances um, and the ways in which they work really differently, but also ultimately work together to create this coherent and unified entertainment experience. And I think looking into that is very interesting and exciting because we can really develop sensibilities, um, uh, sensitivities for forms and, and, and how they work and, and why they are different and how their differences matter and, and things like that. And, and also, you know, I, I think it's exciting to teach those two students. Um, you know, as a, uh, someone coming from narrative theory uh, background, I'm always interested in forms and techniques and with uh, media convergence and transmedia storytelling, it's just uh, easy for me to draw my students students' attention to the forms and their, their operation. So it's exciting for both scholarly you know, context, but also pedagogical context. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and we're going to talk about your teaching in a minute here. Right. Um, I know that you, you yourself have some scholarship in the volume, well, lots of scholarship, but in particular, um, this mukbang, is that how you yeah. say it? Yeah, and mukbang. This, yeah, mukbang and the single nation approach to media. So we're going from, you know, transmedia, big scope, convergence, uh, multi-modal, multi-layered, and then this particular study that's very kind of regionally specific or nation specific. Yeah, so mukbang is a, um, it's kind of a known phenomenon right now, but um, so mukbang is um, eating and broadcasting. Um, it generally refers to this uh, webcast programs where a host will be eating a large quantity of uh, mostly junk food uh, while interacting with the viewers using a chat box. So you see mukbang on YouTube and, and so forth. Um, it's a very culturally, as you pointed out, situated media product in a sense that uh, the popularity of mukbang can be explained through the understanding of Korean culture today. Um, for example, you know, in Korea, we have this increasing sense of uh, isolation and individualism, and one-person household is increasing, but still eating is a big kind of communal activity in Korea. So, so those people who are living alone, um, they watch mukbang so that they can feel as though they are eating with somebody. Mm. So that kind of explains why mukbang is so popular, but, but, but also, you know, a lot of people watch mukbang um, to go on a diet. So, so they watch mukbang and they watch someone else eating and they derive kind of vicarious pressure of eating. So they can um, get the pressure of eating without having to eat and without having to worry about getting fat, right? <laughs> so, so that's how mukbang became popular, culturally speaking, but also it's kind of interesting in terms of the, um, the use of the digital media and medium affordances and so forth. In my study of mukbang, I'm interested in the interactivity between the host and viewers and how that interactivity shapes uh, what's being produced out of mukbang in terms of the verbal and visual and it's kind of live a narrative production that's happening there. And, and, and also it's interesting because it's a chat box that's attached to the mukbang show. What's happening is that the viewers interact with each other as well, right? So there are multiple layers of narrative construction happening and there is this construction of fandom on the other hand and, and, and it's just a lot of crazy things happening. It's crazy but interesting and you can make sense of it once uh, you start looking into it closely. So fascinating. And um, in, in this picture we have in front of us, that is quite a plate of food yeah. and a bowl there of noodles. Um, my goodness. Anyway, um, you also work on webtoons, but yeah. specifically 
um, Korean bad taste webtoons. Can you yeah. tell us um, all, all about this? I'm really curious. Right. So, so the webtoon is a Korean uh, term for digital comics. Um, and those um, Korean digital comics became popular in Korea in 1990s. Um, and that's when we got uh, started. And Bad Taste Webtoon is a genre of the webtoons. And they use um, sketchy drawings and unprofessional looking drawings. And they also use a lot of really unpleasant, disgusting and violent visuals and verbals. So, so again, um, bad taste webtoon can be understood as a kind of a cultural product on the one hand, but also kind of technological and medium specific product on the other hand. Culturally speaking, you know, scholars say that, you know, bad taste webtoons really challenge the uh, kind of social pressure, pressure of uh, having to be always right and better because um, those webtoon are just very unprofessionally put together, right? And people enjoy those things. So, so people read bad taste webtoons as a way to get away from the social pressure of having to be right and better. So that's the kind of cultural element. But I'm more interested in understanding better how the bad taste webtoon writers kind of enable um, their readers to enjoy and embrace something so negative and unpleasant, right? Because very often when you confront something very negative, you may have this uh, experience of personal distress in your mind. And, you know, Susan King says personal distress can cause readers to turn away from reading altogether, right? But how can the bad taste weapons avoid that kind of thing, right? And, and so, so what I found interesting is that um, a lot of those, almost all of those bad taste webtoons, they make sure that their readers are put in the position of a distant observer, right? So instead of engaging readers deeply into their narrative, they will make sure that the readers are somewhat distanced. And in order to achieve the distance, uh, they simplify the uh, page layout and gutter so that readers do not have to actively make sense of what they see and get feel, right? So they just take it easy and watch it from the distance. And they also, those webtoons also kind of make sure that they erase our uh, readable fictional minds. So instead of uh, encouraging readers to identify with or empathize with um, certain characters, uh, they just make sure that all of their characters are just unreadable permanently. You know, of course, you can engage with unreadable characters too, but, but when you put together all those visual choices and other elements of bad taste webtoons, um, the, this, those unreadable characters become definitely someone to <clears throat> kind of avoid, right? So, so I think generally speaking, I think it's really interesting because bad taste web writers make sure that they avoid using any narrative techniques or forms that any other writers will uh, use in order to engage their readers deeply into their fictional world. So, so bad taste webtoon is just another example of a popular culture where that really challenge our existing understanding about how fiction should work or how we should read. So in that sense, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, and is there a, a certain kind of format for their right. presentation? Um, I'm noticing here on our slides, for instance, that it's almost like a reel, a film reel. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's because, uh, you know, Koreans uh, read those webtoons, not only bad taste webtoons, but webtoons generally on their mobile phones. So it's optimized the best for the mobile phone. So, so you have to kind of scroll it down. So it's always like this kind of vertical uh, arrangement. So it's just really easy to read. You don't have to think much, just to keep on scrolling down. So that's the kind of attraction for uh, webtoons, but also that's why bad taste webtoons work. You don't have to be serious about it. Everything is mm. like benign. So fascinating and um, wow, uh, amazing the work you're doing. Can you share some of your work on um, this continent, comics, Asian comics, Canadian and US? Yeah, um, I, um, you know, recently I've been more interested in digital comics, but I've done more work on um, uh, print comics in the past. And also in my second book, I'm talking about print comics as well. So I'm interested in the visualization of uh, Asian American stereotypes in comics. 
So how those stereotypes are visualized in certain way to uh, you know shape readers' reading and understanding in specific ways. In shortcomings, I can see that you have uh, this image of a uh, shortcoming by Adrian Tomine. He engages with the idea of um, you know the stereotype of Asian American inscrutability. The idea that you know Asians and Asian Americans are difficult to read and they have a very limited range of emotion expression strategies, and and so in that book in particular we have this anti protagonist who is difficult to read and who is only expressing negative emotional feelings. And my question there is of you know to start with how that um, you know scrutability is visualized, but how it is visualized in such a way that it creates this push and pull effect between the protagonist and readers. So uh, we kind of identify with the protagonist, but also because of uh, the protagonist inscrutability, we stay away from that uh, protagonist. But then ultimately, um, through that kind of push pull effect. So we um, kind of come to understand that his inscrutability is really hinges on you know larger cultural uh, context of his life. Um, so so that's what I generally talk about. I think Tamaki's work is really interesting. Uh, she's um, Japanese Canadian. She is less concerned with the Asian American subject matters in specific. But um, in, in Boundless in specific, it's a collection of short comics. They are kind of separate seemingly, but they're also really interconnected. So Tamaki really encourages readers to make this meta cognitive connection in their mind and put together all those uh, disparate, uh, separate um, comics ultimately. And, and another interesting aspect of Boundless is that Tamaki really encourages uh, her readers to physically respond to the book. Like, uh, for example, you have to turn the book upside down to read or turn it to the side to read, right? So it's just that I think comics are interesting because they kind of uh, you know, present to us uh, just a whole different set of reading experience. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for all your work in that space, um, Haisu. Um, <laughs> Tell us about, uh, you maybe already hinted at it, but tell us about your new forthcoming book, Understanding Hell You. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, um, it's, um, it's going to be out in December this year. So the full title of the book is Understanding uh, Hallyu, Korean Wave Through uh, Literature, Webtoon, and Mukbang. So I talk about literature, like uh, novels and the comics. And, you know, because I talk about the globalization of Korean literature, I, of course, talk about the uh, issues of translation. So I actually refer to your work, Why the Humanities Matter and Why the translation matters there. So I talk about the mechanics and politics of translation um, uh, in that chapter. And I talk about Webtoon. Um, the, um, I talk about bad taste Webtoon, but I also talk about experimental Webtoon. That's something that I got interested in recently. So experimental Webtoon, again, it's um, using the these two technologies, so it uses augmented reality, facial recognition, and 360 panorama view. And, and with all those technologies, um, you know, those experimental webtoon really enhances uh, embodied and experiential reading experience, right? So what, what it means to be embodied when you read uh, becomes a totally different um, thing when you read those experimental webtoons. It's very exciting for me. Um, I talk about mukbang, uh, but in that uh, book, um, you know, I focus more specifically on the interactivity. So, but two types of interactivity, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, the interactivity between the host and viewers, but the interactivity among the viewers in the chat box. And I'm kind of looking into the fandom studies and how that um, interactivity within the chat box leads to the uh, kind of the construction of the communal uh, um, um, like sense of community, right? And, and how that kind of adds to the fandom theory in the virtual space. So yeah, so it's, um, it's exciting. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Wow, this is gonna be, uh, it's already groundbreaking. I can't <laughs> wait for it to be in the world. Um, hey, so who's publishing it? Uh, Rutledge is publishing it. Perfect, brilliant. Um, so 
Yeah, let's talk. You mentioned a little earlier、um, your teaching, and yeah, how do you bring?、Um, I don't know how, why this slide says Latinx, but how do you bring pop culture,、um, Korean, South Korean,、uh, Asian,、um, Asian transmedia, Asian, etc., or just in general pop culture、right. into your classrooms? You know, I、uh, you know I I do teach Latinx pop culture as well, so so that part、oh. is definitely relevant to me. I haven't done it、uh, as much recently because my recent book projects really focus on the Asian media, right? Um, I think it's just that teaching pop culture in general in the classroom is a good thing. It's a good thing because the students like it. Um, and and I feel as though when I teach pop culture and bring pop culture into the classroom, I can really empower my students. And、uh, because I acknowledge it that my students may know a lot more than myself when it comes to certain pop culture, so they identify with it, relate to it, they become the authority of the subject matter. So I think、uh, pop culture is a great way to engage students in the first place. And and also for me to learn from my students, but of course, what I do as a teacher is that I kind of offer some of those、um, you know tools, right? Tools for interpretation, so that my students can、um, become more sensitive in terms of how they talk about pop culture and how they write about pop culture, and 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 how and also I I make sure that those tools, like whether that's an archaeological or formal or cultural, contribute to their understanding. Of the、uh, cultural and political sensibilities、um, of、uh, pop culture as well. So, so I I hope I can teach more of the pop culture. I don't I I don't get to teach it all the time, but whenever there is a chance, I I try. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important a, a way for us to connect deeply with our students, but at the same time bring the rigor of kind of you know deep analysis of knowledge building of、uh, all those things that you just talked about. Hey Sue, tell me where do you see the vitality in media culture studies today and transnational cultural studies in Asia today? You know, it's um the vitality is always changing, so dynamic, it's changing so rapidly that I cannot possibly keep up with. You know what's happening over there.、Uh, a few interesting things. Um, if I um can talk about uh right now is that I think that the pro amateur video production that I talked about earlier is very interesting, and and how those amateur video production we see on YouTube and etc. Lead to this overall、uh, co creative culture between the professional and amateur. And and what's interesting is that the amateur producers are encouraging those.、Uh, in, I'm sorry, the professional producers actually are encouraging those amateur production as well, where those amateurs are using some of those professional production in order to create their remixes and etc. And and how they kind of again、uh, are influencing the overall. Landscape and ecology of media production today.、Uh, so that's interesting. Fandom is really interesting.、Um, you know, fandom. I mean, it's everywhere, but it's really huge in Asia.、And、I think it's partially because、uh, Asia is such a communal culture. So people love to get together and create their sense of community, and fans love to do that. So fandom theory and fandom studies is a big part of the、uh, vitality in Asia right now. And Vlog, vlog is very interesting. The kind of shift from the、uh, website-based blog to the audiovisual vlog, and and that's very big in Korea、uh, currently. And but but I think what's also interesting is that in terms of that、um, specific geographical context of Asia, right? I mean, Asia is a very contested region in a sense that a lot of Asian nations are having conflicts with each other. Japan and Korea, you know, India and China, China and Taiwan and Hong Kong. So we are always,、uh, you know, politically fighting. But at the same time, there have been always active media sharing and culture sharing. And and you know, I don't want to be too ideological or idealistic here, but but I want to see how the culture. Cultural sharing can kind of、uh, you know offer some sort of、uh, not solution per se, but new insights into the kind of、uh, political conflicts that we are experiencing in Asia、uh, right now. So so many things, and and it's just that、um, it's a kind of never ending, I guess,、uh, learning experience. It's really amazing to me, Haisu, that we don't know more about the kind of the vitality of. 
transmedia convergences of media um, growth and um, multimodal sort of forms that are coming out of Asia. I just, uh, do you have a, a guess at why? Yeah, it's, it's just, I don't think it's a very good question. Um, I think, I think again, I, because the technology is a very part of uh, our lives in Asia. Um, you know, you think about Taiwan and Japan and Korea and China, they are just leading a lot of technological innovations and a lot of younger population and very hot, hot, you know, educated population. So, so the Asians are good. I mean, it sounds too kind of stereotypical, but, but we are familiar with the technologies. And, and also, I think for a long time, I think Asia was depicted in such a way that it's very calm people and quiet people. So we never knew this other weird side of Asians, right? But, but I think they are just uh, emerging more actively right now with the uh, you know, development of digital technology and, and, and those new ideas are easily circulated now, right? So something that we never noticed in the West, we are noticing it now finally, thanks to the circulation of uh, digital media. But um, yeah, but it's, it's interesting for me as well that I'm coming from Asia. Yeah, absolutely fascinating, amazing. Taisi Park comics, media culture tr in Asia, in the planet, transnational, regional, they matter. Thank you, Haisu. Thank you, Frederick.